Henrietta Weaver stood on a hill, looking at the cage where the Vosselin army held Sarah Hale. A Vosselian herself, she could have only so much sympathy for the woman who attempted to knife their prince. But after spending time in a cell with Sarah, when both women were suspected of killing Prince Giacomo, Henrietta had wished that there was something she could do to help this woman. I am not bound by the code of law. I understand why she did what she did. The least I could do is help her. She watched the night before, as a squadron of soldiers led Sarah to the forest, and when they had returned, the prisoner had been washed clean, which showed there was some flexibility in the arrangement. So there might be a way for Henrietta to help Sarah, even a little bit. But another barrier was that the women of the night needed to remain at least 40 paces away from camp. With these limitations, an idea began to creep into Henrietta's mind. A wild idea, but one that just might work. All she needed was a willing participant. And later that evening, she got one. A Vosselian captain came to Henrietta's tent. The armored woman wanted companionship. Though Henrietta had male colleagues worthy and willing to service her, she had chosen Henrietta instead, a thought that struck Henrietta as purely natural. After all, sometimes it's nice to have some girl time. In preparation for their intimate encounter, Henrietta had slipped a tiny draft of sleeping potion within the soldier's wineskin. It was a harmless tincture, it could effectively knock out a heavy man for hours at a time. Standard issue for women and men of her trade. Sleep was their ally, and much preferable to violence. After all, it was far easier to call at a moment's notice. When their pleasure was ended, and the captain was successfully drugged, Henrietta snuck around her tent, seizing the various bits of armor off the canvas and slipping them on. Henrietta had undressed enough soldiers to roughly be aware of the procedure in reverse, but still found it challenging. After a lot of fitting the wrong gauntlets on the wrong hands, adjusting the mail a little too tight, and various other problems, as well as the profanity to go with them, she finally fitted the armor onto her body. She looked at herself in the mirror, impressed with her disguise. Let's hope the darkness will aid me in this endeavor. She placed her helmet over her head, and out she went from her tent, looking like a soldier, but feeling like a creamed dessert mashed into a pewter tin. Henrietta walked through the camp awkwardly. The woman whom she bedded was a size larger than Henrietta, so her thighs rubbed together uncomfortably. But that was the least of her concerns. The male weighed on her oppressively, so with each step, felt like she was being dragged into the earth by demons. She'd heard before of men being pressed to death with stones, but had never before thought she would ever experience something similar to it. She passed a group of Vosleans sitting by a brazier, lower-ranked officers, it seemed like. Their armor was too polished to be that of common foot soldiers, and even their servants appeared better appareled than some of their infantry. They drank beer out of steins and laughed, casting dice. Whenever the dice landed on a number, some man or other threw his hands up in despair, whilst others doubled over in mirthful agony. She passed another section of soldiers, playing instruments and singing. Their voices were badly off-key, and the song's lyrics were muddled and half-remembered. But they all were bursting with joy. Every corner she turned, Walking through the camp, she found another group of soldiers reveling or relaxing. It was as if every walk of life in humanity were concentrated in this one army camp. They look like they're preparing for a wedding, not a battle. Suddenly, a familiar face appeared from a nearby tent. It was the crown prince, Lionel Zorzi. He was followed by his brother, who was limping along, and bandaged in the neck. Henrietta bowed immediately, keeping her head trailed to the ground. 
she prayed that the princes wouldn't recognize her. Her heart sank, and the bootsteps stopped near her. Rise, soldier. What are you doing? Henrietta stood, praying that the darkness successfully hid what little of her face was visible underneath her helmet. She looked at the princes and snapped a salute. Prince Lionel laughed derisively. Ah, now she remembers he's a soldier. His brother sighed from behind him. Lionel, for many it takes an adjustment to replace bowing with saluting. Henrietta swore to herself. Of course, officers in the military were not expected to bow before their sovereign on duty. Since he was their commander, they were to salute him. If Henrietta had the means to turn back time to avert this colossal mistake, she would have done so. But alas, there she stood, rooted to the spot. Prince Lionel continued. Captain should know better. Who be thy commanding officer, Captain? Uh, Niccolo Metzi. The name came to her immediately. Whether it was that of a former client, old friend, or school chum, her panicking brain could not recall. The lie was seamless and escaped her mouth before her more rational faculties could stop it. Prince Lionel nodded sagely. Ah, uh, Commander Metzi. I'll make sure he knows to train his captains more thoroughly. Of course, sir. A thousand apologies. She snapped another salute, while inwardly laughing to herself. The crown prince doesn't know the names of his officers. Prince Lionel strode off without further acknowledgement of Henrietta's existence, like a house cat, at once occupied with a new toy, then immediately disinterested. Prince Giacomo followed, slower, but he fixed Henrietta with an interested eye. She held her dutiful soldier pose until he disappeared out of sight. Then she relaxed with a sigh. Her shoulders screamed in protest. The burden of a soldier is more than that of their blade, also their arms. She continued her quest and finally was by the cages, which sat on their own, great structures of ironwork sitting upon rolling carts. The only prisoner of war was, so far, Sarah Hale, paced within one of them. Henrietta approached one of the guards. He didn't seem to recognize her, but snapped to attention upon seeing the winged helm of a captain. Sir, you are to take a break for an hour. I will watch the prisoner. The soldier stared. But, uh, Captain, I, uh, I am not to be relieved for another four hours. Then consider this a blessing. Take an hour, refresh yourself in whatever ways you need to, and be back here in an hour. It is an order. The guard snapped his salute, not eager to overly question his good fortune. Uh, will you be needing the keys, sir? No. I suspect the prisoner will know better than to require up-close instruction from me. The guard chuckled. He then shambled away. Henrietta grinned, pleased with the newfound power she felt within this uncomfortable costume. From inside her cell, Sarah regarded Henrietta interestedly. You are not a regular captain here. Nay. Sarah leaned up against the bars, peering closer. Do I know you? Speak lower. Yes. Sarah gasped. It is you, the strumpet who I was in here with. Shh, keep thy voice in thy head. How'd you get that armor? Use thy imagination. Sarah giggled. Why did you come here? I wished to help thee. Uh, how? To break me out? Henrietta shook her head solemnly. Impossible. They would skin me alive. Henrietta posed carefully, looking away from the cage. She held a small bundle out behind her. Sarah grabbed it and looked. 
It was a quill pen and paper. I am sure thou has loved ones, friends. Write to them. You have one hour. And Henrietta strode away from the cage, standing about as far away as the guard had done. As far as she could tell, no one was near enough or interested enough to make much of an effort to spy on a random prisoner. But she didn't want to take any chances. So she stood by and waited. Minutes wore by as Sarah wrote and wrote. Henrietta became more and more anxious as she waited for the guard to return and discover her treachery. A slight tapping on the cage arrested Henrietta's senses again. She turned and saw Sarah holding out two pieces of paper, folded, with names scratched onto them. Henrietta held out her hand. Sarah withdrew. Before you take these, swear... You will not read a word of them. Uh, I swear, only the names. I need a more binding oath than that, Henrietta. Convince me that these are safe with you, and you will not just deliver me into a swift noose. Henrietta took a deep breath. Ah, I swear on my long-lost daughter, these letters will see no vastly an eye but mine. A flash of sympathy crossed Sarah's face. She handed over her messages. Henrietta kept her hand out. Sarah looked confused. Mm, what? And the pen as well. I do not need my head to be removed because I snuck a lockpick into the cage. Sarah sighed and handed it over. I suppose for now, contact with freedom will have to suffice in place of the real thing. Henrietta nodded, sadly. I wish I could do more. I will not hold it against ye. It's more than anyone else has done for me. Take care of yourself. It was another quarter hour before the guard returned to his post, later than he had promised. Henrietta took great pleasure in berating him in her best stern officer voice before making the long trek back to her quarters. An hour since she'd first made her way through the camp. Lights were starting to dim. The soldiers' curfew was in effect soon, and many of the rank and file preferred to put themselves to bed before the officers did it for them. So fewer people, even than the last time, paid Henrietta any mind. She hurried back to her quarters as fast as she could, without arousing suspicion or fracturing her shoulders. By this point in the night, she was so doused in sweat that she worried her armor might rust before she had a chance to give it back. Henrietta slipped back into her tent, praying that her soldier was still asleep. Thankfully, she was. Though she did stir slightly when Henrietta entered the room. This told her that the potion was wearing off. So, Henrietta hastily undressed. Removing the weighty layers of metal felt like a battle in and of itself. Henrietta cursed. It was a small wonder most knights had servants before they could afford heraldry. A person's priorities tended to shift when they had to wear three to four stones of armor on their back. By the time she had freed herself from her metal prison, her skin was slick as an eel. She felt like a newborn babe, albeit with more soreness than an infant could possibly imagine. She gently scattered the objects around the room making sure they appeared like they had before she first deserted her lover of the night. Then she quickly wiped a towel over herself, before slipping back into bed with the captain she had been impersonating for the better part of two hours. The soldier's eyes fluttered open. She sleepishly whispered in Henrietta's ear, Restless, are we? I think we can find ways to tire you out. Henrietta grinned. She winked. But inside, her aching body sighed. <sighs> One day, I will take a vacation. Baylor sat alone in his cave next to a fire. Without the warming draft, or at least what he thought was a warming draft, fire was all he had left to survive. In his mind, he kept replaying his last telepathic exchange with Nathan, he was particularly stuck on where it ended. I thought I could help this way. 
An answer that did little more than spawn more questions. How could this help? How far did he expect to take this plan? At what cost? Why not just fly home into the arms of his loved ones? Why couldn't he at least tell us? Baylor failed to make any sense of it. But that's normally how all of Nathan's plans went. It was a less desirable aspect of his personality, from Baylor's point of view. It always left those close to Nathan on the edge of their seats with constant uncertainty. But this was a whole other level. There would be no closure until Baylor could muster the strength for another conversation. The first came to an abrupt end, thanks to Baylor's lack of expertise. Telepathy was no simple trick, and it required a great deal of spiritual energy. As a result, it had been two full days before Baylor could feel the full volume of his aura return. Baylor closed his eyes and wrapped his fingers around the glass tincture holding what little remained of the warming draft. He felt the spiritual energy course through his veins and pour through his fingertips into the vial like it was a pool of blood, thick, viscous, but directly connected to his life. Just as before, his thoughts shot through the sky and arched downwards towards Sky Hall. He could feel himself not more than a few yards from Nathan's base camp tent when... Suddenly, hunger reaped Baylor of all focus. He gripped his belly whilst fighting off a wave of nausea. All the spiritual energy retracted back up through his arms and sealed itself away deep down in his core, unwilling to re-emerge until the rest of his body had been satiated. It had been a few days since his last meal, and that ended up in chunks on the snow. He relied heavily on the snowfall for water, but what would do little to curb his growling organs? Starvation was still a week or two away, but at his level, telepathy would be nigh impossible without his other needs being met first. Before Baylor could once again find Nathan, he had to first find lunch. The mountains of Schuylerland lacked a varied menu. A true shame, for Baylor had always been a picky eater, he preferred fruits, vegetables, and grains, really anything grown from the land. But these lands were sealed over with ice, a near-permanent winter that killed off any crops long before they'd yield anything nutritional. If Baylor desired a leafy meal, he would find none better than frozen pine needles. Yuck. Thus, meat was Baylor's only option. It wasn't as if Baylor never ate meat. Even the Hayland winters struggled to produce hardy crops, but it had never been his first choice. Not a bite would go by, for he was not conscious of dead flesh falling down his gullet. His aversion began as a child, whilst watching his father slay the family swine. For Padrick Graham, it had just been another chore before dinner, but Baylor rather liked that pig. Perhaps he saw something of himself, in the eyes of the slaughtered. Or maybe he just got used to a finer palate, being the son of a merchant after all. It's not like Baylor ever truly knew the face of hunger growing up. Podrick had done well enough as a father to keep food on the table and catered to Baylor's needs with ease. But Podrick was no more. And in his place, Baylor found a white-furred rabbit. Its skull was pierced through by an arrow, Calandrian from the look of it. It was surrounded by frozen bodies, also Calandrian. But Vosselin corpses rested there as well. Without realizing it, Baylor had backtracked to the battlegrounds from a few days prior. This was where he suffered defeat at the hands of Nathan. It had not been a fond memory. By now, all the blood had dried, and a majority of the cruel acts were buried beneath the snow. Yet, the rabbit stood out in one piece. It seemed to be perfectly preserved by the cold windows of Sky Hall. A grim silver line, but one Baylor would readily take, for war and wilderness cry no mercy for the picky eaters of the world. Baylor grilled the meat over the fire. But his stomach had no patience. 
It groveled for food like a spoiled child does for toys. Finally, the food was done. He dared not wait for it to cool, nearly burning his mouth and his throat as he consumed it, tearing the meat from the bone. It had a stale taste and the meat required a thorough gnawing. It would no doubt go down in history as one of Baylor's least favorite meals in memory. Yet, when the bunny reached his belly, it left Baylor with a grateful feeling. This was not a meal. This was survival. He ate every bit of flesh and sucked marrow from the bone. He couldn't afford to lose out any nutrition. The stakes were too high. And at the end of it all, with a full belly and a fire to keep him warm, it seemed the perfect moment to talk to a friend. Nathan was in the middle of scarfing down a bowl of lukewarm Vosselin gruel. It was not the most flavorful cuisine, nor was it meant to be. This was fuel. Fuel to feed men that would go on to feed war. For that reason, he almost preferred it flavorless. But he certainly preferred it in his mouth, as opposed to his nose. But when Baylor's voice rang out in his head, he did not have much choice over the matter. Nathan? Nathan? Are you there? Nathan looked around to see the eyes of several Vaslin soldiers staring at him with a perplexed look. Nathan felt obliged to fill the silence. <clears throat> Must have swallowed a tooth. The crowd moved on, most likely to avoid any further conversation with a maniac who'd swallowed his own tooth. Nathan, I can feel your thoughts. Answer me. Nathan figured if he left, it might pique the interest of others. It was time to feed. No man in war would skip a meal without a motive worth investigating. So he returned his gruel and did his best to repress a face of excitement. Baylor, where have you been the last few days? How did you get, well, within my own mind? The Baylor I knew was a decade away from such feats. Where have I been? I have been with the Calandrians, with Ian, Ulrich, and Amelia. I've been exactly where you should have been. The momentary excitement was quick to fade. Nathan had not prepared for chastising, especially from Baylor Graham. I, I, I know. You do not know? How could you? You do not know of how your sister wept for her dead brother, or how your father wept for the same. We risked everything on the hope you still breathe, and you repay us with a broken rib, a warming draft, and a cold, lonely walk home? Nathan's teeth gritted against the cold metal spoon in his mouth. He was desperate to hold on to his facade while amongst the brass, for he knew there were always eyes upon him. But he was equally aware of the truth in Baylor's words. You are completely in the right, but I've yet found the power to turn back time. Have you yet to find the power of an apology, too? Nathan sighed. But before he could answer, one of Artemisia's guards appeared. General Artemisia seeks your audience. <laughs> yes, sir. But no words came from his mouth. Baylor screamed at his brain. Pardon thee? Do you not care? Instead, they would wander to Baylor's mind. Nathan had lost track of who to talk to and how to manage to simultaneously insult his dear friend while remaining entirely silent in response to an order from his commander. Artemisia's guard grew impatient for an answer. Now, Kedvin, I need an answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Of course. Apologies. This time, he spoke properly and stood up from his seat. Baylor. You are unbelievable! That was not meant for you. I am being summoned by General Artemisia. We'll have to talk later. General? What are you talking about? I risked everything for this moment. I will not allow you to swat me away like a fly on the arse of a cow. Nathan followed in step 
behind the guard towards Artemisia's tent. He knew for certain she would catch his mind between conversations, but he would need more time to explain to Baylor. I am the only one, Nathan, the only one who fought for this opportunity. I had to prove you were not a traitor. I am no traitor. The guard whipped around, confused. Nathan had blundered yet again. The guard furrowed his brow and readied his sword arm. A rather suspicious thing for one to claim unprompted. Nathan took a moment to confirm the correct means of communication. This moment, like every moment behind enemy lines, required delicate precision. I only wish to proclaim my loyalty. You are a strange man. Answer me, Nathan. I know you can still hear me. Nathan gripped his stomach. Apologies. I am not myself. I fear I've lost a duel with my innards. The guard's face shifted from suspicion to disgust. Go. Tend to your problem so that it will no longer be mine. Quickly. Nathan took off towards the latrine, a wooden shack with several stalls that each had a deep hole dug within. He slammed the wooden stall door behind him. Answer me, Nathan! It was not a place many would want described. Baylor, I am here. I apologize. I apologize for everything I made you endure. From the morning that need not happen, for the depression I've brought upon you and all of my loved ones, and for this very war itself. He waited for Baylor to respond, but the silence prompted a further explanation. I am not a traitor, nor did I intend to cause any harm. But the truth is, I lost. I lost to Simon, and it nearly cost us all of Calandria. But here, disguised as a Voslander, under the guise of death, I have a rare opportunity to learn from my mistakes. Again he waited, this time longer, desperate to hear his friend's voice. The silence ate at his soul. Once again, Nathan felt alone, just as he reached for the stall door. But why did you have to do so alone? We were right there. Ian and I could have helped. You could have at least told us. I do not know that to be true. Voslin's insights know no limits, but, uh, truth be told, I never considered the notion of help. It's not something I ask for often, if ever. One of many weaknesses I've only just discovered. When will you return? I do not know. What are you waiting for? Something um, significant. Something that will change the tides of war. I'd argue the great warrior Nathan Hayfield would qualify. Nathan chuckled. Well, <laughs> it might. But for now, I am Ian Kedwin. Besides, I am not the only Calandrian within Skyhall. I cannot leave without her. I must deal with both the former and current Dukes of Skyhall. She lives then? She does. She was the first to know of my ploy. You are the second. I trust you'll spread word carefully. Only after I find a way to return to them, I took a gamble on this opportunity. Well, you must. But not yet. Give me just a few more days' time. By then, I might have word worth spreading. Hurry up in there. Artemisia waits for no man. Baylor, I must go. We will speak soon. Wait for me to reach you. Telepathy has no way to translate a sigh, but Nathan could feel a hint of disappointment from Baylor. What choice do I have? Once again, I'm forced to trust in the great Nathan Hayfield. Mm, be careful. Nathan smiled. Now, Kedvin! Uh, yes, sir. Sir Ian Lightstone's eyes flickered open. His vision was blurry. He saw stars. He blinked twice, attempting to bring the world into focus, and yet 
it still hovered just outside of his reach, as if his body itself wasn't ready to accept that he was still in this world. <coughs> Hello? His voice echoed distantly. It sounded like he was underwater, even though air flowed freely through his lungs. He blinked and groaned. A tight bandage was wrapped around his face. His head throbbed. It felt weirdly hollow, like someone had dug out parts of his skull and left cavernous openings in their place. Uh, Amelia? A fuzzy figure appeared in his vision. Sir Ian, you're awake. We will summon Lady Amelia presently. She is treating other patients currently. Ian looked around. From the sounds of other men and women groaning, he could tell he was in the healing ward. He felt a hand on his shoulder. Good to see you're awake, sir. He looked up. His vision was still too blurry. Who are you? Do you not recognize me? Lysander. We blew up the bridge together? Uh, of course. Cry your mercy. But I'm having trouble seeing at the moment. But did we destroy the bridge? Aye, we did. Uh, how many of us made it? A few of us sustained minor injuries. I would point at the sling on my arm, if I knew you could see it. Just an arrow in the shoulder. Uh, we also lost Portia. She was shot and fell into the gorge. The rest of us are well, however. Well, that's good to know. We will be giving you honors for your achievement in the war effort. We didn't do it for honors, Sir Ian. We did it because it needed to be done. Which is precisely why you should be honored, Lysander. Those who do things not expecting reward are all the more deserving of reward. Suddenly... A fit of coughing overtook Sir Ian. He fell back and spat up a dark glob. Lysander looked at it. Well, at least it's not blood. I will leave you, sir. I suspect you'd rather talk to her. He turned, and suddenly a huge mass of human flopped on him, embracing his prone form. Amelia? My love, you are awake. So people keep reminding me. What happened? An arrow to the face, my love? Do you not remember? You were crying out in agony as we extracted the point. Sir Ian grimaced at the idea of such an undignified spectacle, but he shook his head. He remembered nothing. You took it out? I? With the help of a career criminal, too. Sir Ian blinked in confusion. His vision was finally coming into focus. His wife sat over him, as beautiful as she had been in his dreams, except with the addition of several new rings around her eyes. He reached out and stroked her cheek. It saddens me that I could have caused such pain in you. She took his hand. Nonsense, my love. You have done the same for me. And we'll do it again, I'm sure. He smiled. A single tear stung his wound. Aye, until death. They kissed. A cough sounded from behind Amelia. Sir Ian looked over. It was Odell Namora and Sir Harry Lyle, standing a few paces back, both smiling. The Duchess spoke. A touching reunion? But do we need to talk about the next strategies before we make our move again? Sir Ian nodded. And back to work we go. It had taken Sir Ian about an hour to make his way to the lookout tower, where Odell's war room had been set up. And even then, they had much to discuss. In the days of his injury and recovery, Sir Ian had missed precious little. The enemy was thrown into disarray by the destruction of the bridge. They didn't have any evident next steps, but they were still far too numerous to attack head-on. Yet. Initial scouting reports showed that the Vosslander's military might was stretched thin, but the Calandrians 
didn't know where to start in launching a counteroffensive. After the disaster that was their mountainside brush with the powerful spiritual warriors, Sir Ian, Odell, and Amelia all agreed that they should use caution while the enemy was able to bring greater numbers to bear. By the end of that day, Sir Ian felt like he had fought a whole battle. So worn out was his body and mind. He walked slowly through Shrouded Cloud City that evening, supported by Amelia. They passed soldiers and the odd civilian. As they did, almost every single one stopped to bow or salute them. They returned the gestures, even as Sir Ian became increasingly uncomfortable with this, given the state of his face. Amelia, where did all these people come from? What people? When we arrived here, it was practically deserted. But now, the streets seem almost close to normal. Oh? I noticed this not. Perhaps they have always been here, and their fear is slowly disappearing. And now, they all seem to know us. Know you. Your destruction of the bridge was legendary. But you were the one who saved me from certain death. In spite of all the odds, I think that warrants some degree of legendary status. You know the way to a woman's heart, my love. Call her legendary, and soon she'll be swooning all over you. Do I need to be shot in the face again for you to swoon over me? Oh, you best not, Sir Ian Lightstone, or else I might just leave the bodkin in you next time. And so they went playfully bantering, walking through the streets of a city that now seemed more alive than it had been in months. If it weren't for the massive hole in Surian's head, one could almost have mistaken it for peace. But the comfort only lasted so long, as the news was awaiting them back in their lodgings. Amelia opened the door and set her husband down on a soft, long chair. Can I send for anything for you, my love? He shook his head. Nay, sweetheart, I need my rest. And he closed his eyes. Amelia smiled at him. Even in the midst of this horror, it felt like she could do anything with him by her side. She looked out the window, watching the winter sunset lay its gentle glow upon the city. And then, an object on the windowsill caught her eye. It was a single letter pinned to the stone sill. She took it out and opened it. Dear Amelia, I have made contact. Skyhall City is vulnerable. Duke Skyler has been reinstated as a puppet ruler. The real power is in the hands of the parents. Oh, I suppose you wonder how I know this. Nathan's alive and undercover amongst the Vosslanders. Baylor Graham. It could be a trap. Odell Namora looked up from Baylor's letter. Amelia, Sir Ian, and Sir Harry all stood around, looking anxious. Amelia was pacing back and forth rapidly, beside herself with excitement. What would such a trap be for? To give us hope? Hope is what we most lack. We have weapons. We have soldiers. We have a fortified castle. What we need is hope. We should tell them this. Whether or not it's true, warriors need a standard to rally behind. Nothing is more powerful than a legend. Sir Ian nodded thoughtfully. Or a martyr. Nathan's memory has already inspired the troops. If he is indeed in deep cover, then exposing him this way would only compromise his cover, should enemy spies get wind of it. Amelia grunted in frustration. There must be some way we can use this. A quiet voice sounded from the corner. It was Sir Harry. I have a notion. What if we start a rumor? I know some captains and lieutenants who are greatly disposed to telling tall tales, whether they be true or not. If we let them spread the word about that Nathan is alive and amongst the Vassal army, then the spies would have no reason to credit it. But nor will it be as dismissed as mere propaganda. Odell smiled. My sister would be proud of you, Harry. Sir Harry blushed. Amelia nodded. 
Tis settled then. We spread the rumor that Nathan lives, but only that much. Enough to scare the Vosslanders and inspire us. Then we can turn our attention to an attack. One we can win. Odell smiled with an air of grim determination. This is a homeland. They can only push us back for so long. They won't destroy the forest entirely unless they take us from the roots. The next day, the majority of the Skylarland resistance assembled in the town square. This was an order from Odell Namora herself. When eventually they all arrived, it was not Odell who stood above them on a platform that used to be a scaffold. It was Sir Ian. The army leader stood above them, his face still bandaged in gauze. He took out a scroll. I would like soldiers Lysander, Elgifu, Dominique, and Sir Harry Lyle to present themselves. The four survivors of the mission to Conqueror's Bridge stood before the crowd. And Quinn Telson. The lanky metal worker had been standing to the side. She stared when she heard her own name, but cautiously approached, looking like she was ready to run at any moment. We honor these brave Calandrians. In times of peace, we make beautiful things. We create art, structures, bonds of friendship, love, camaraderie, and many other objects of wonder. He paused dramatically. Civilians congregated on the outer sides of the square, jostling to see Sir Ian speak. Others peeped their heads through second-story windows, relishing the chance to drink in this man who, by all accounts, was a war hero in the making. And in war, we unmake them. These four soldiers here, along with myself, took into their hands a task for which history will not remember them kindly. They took a feat of engineering, years' worth of work, and unmade it. They did this so that, at least for today, we sleep comfortably. Well, as comfortable as one can, two mere miles from death. <laughs> Laughter spread through the crowd. Amelia glowed with pride. For this unmaking, and for the sacrifices of those of us who have fallen, we honor them this day. After a moment of applause... Sir Ian raised his arm, and the crowd was silent again. And forget not those that can remake what the enemy seeks to unmake. Quinn Telson, who was facing a life behind bars, chose to help us and save my life. For that, she has our eternal thanks. Some people cheered, but the reception to this honor was slightly lukewarm. After all, Quinn was not well-liked among many people, particularly bankers and accountants, and anyone with a lockbox they wanted to keep locked. Sir Ian passed right through this and continued. And of course, let us not forget Amelia Hayfield, the Lady Lightstone. A general cheer went up. Amelia flushed red. It is her hands with Telson's tools that allow me to speak today. She is the greatest healer of our age, and without her, we would surely be lost. He looked over the entire crowd, soldier and civilian alike, and he slowly removed his bandage. Sir Ian had yet to see how he looked in the mirror, but the crowd shifted uncomfortably at the colossal scar on his right cheek. He smiled, ignoring the groan of pain his cheek screamed at him. This cannot be it. Though we have no victory yet to celebrate, we live. Yes, we all live, and today we thrive. My brothers, my sisters, as long as we draw breath, we are victorious. A great cheer rose up from the crowd. It was so loud that surely the Vosslanders could hear it and were shaking in their boots. The Skyland resistance cried out in defiance. All the while, the leaders prayed that some miracle could save them from their imminent destruction. Elder Dre wore a wicked frown. 
He sat behind a stone desk that looked to be carved straight from the earth, tapping his finger along its top whilst lost in thought. Faster, faster, and faster he tapped, until the entire room began to shake. Clods of dirt and loose rubble sprinkled down from above until nearly the entire tower began to rumble. Dre's door swung wide open as a Doom Faction acolyte entered out of alarm. Elder Dre, is the Doom Castle under attack? Elder Dre paused, and the world returned to normal. What do you... Uh oh, apologies. I sometimes lose myself and cause a rumble. They had no mind. The color flushed from the acolyte's face as they attempted to wrap their mind around Elder Dre's unconscious power. Dre cocked an eyebrow at the youngster, a woman with brunette hair. He recognized her face, but couldn't quite place why. Oh, what was her name? I think she had some cute title, like the Sickener, or was it the Trickster? Hmm. You. Who are you? Have we met before? She dropped down to a knee and averted her gaze. Garnering the attention of an elder was not always the wisest. Rumors had spread about some of the other elders using a few untalented acolytes for their experiments. N no, sir. My name is Kayla Carlson. I'm a first-year acolyte. Please, uh, pardon my intrusion. I only meant to... Hmm, no, that's not it. Your other name. I've heard it before somewhere. And just like that, all the color that drained from her face returned in full form. Perhaps too much color. Her cheeks bled the bright red hue of embarrassment. Oh, um, well, some have referred to me as... She let out a deep sigh, bracing herself for the worst. Uh, the Poisoner. Oh, that's right. The Poisoner. <laughs> I recall that you nearly killed my young protege back in the Doom Trials. Elder Dre stared daggers at her. Sweat barreled down the back of Kayla's neck as her eyes locked onto the floor. She knew not what to think of Elder Dre's words. A lesser man might punish someone of Kayla's title for jeopardizing an asset, even if it was far before that asset was in his grasp. But Elder Dre had always been more dramatic than he was villainous. He let out a light chuckle and adjusted his posture to ease the tension. He knew exactly what effect he had on the acolytes and had the bad habit of enjoying it, not for the sake of pride, but for a laugh. Well, not many can claim they fought Nathan Hayfield and lived to tell the tale. Perhaps the Poisoner is worthy of some attention as well. Uh, thanks? What? Did I say something wrong? No, no, of course not. Your words are too kind, but... Oh, out with it already. Oh, I prefer my given name. I never claimed it for myself. And to be entirely truthful, I don't adore it in the slightest. I mean, the Poisoner sounds a bit too much like the villain of a children's tale, don't you think? You don't like the Poisoner? I do not. Well, then what am I supposed to call you? Well, uh, Kayla Carlson would do just fine. Elder Dre stroked his beard in thought. This might have been the most interesting thing to happen to him all morning. No, Kayla is quite the forgettable name, I'm afraid. The Poisoner will do just fine. Don't be afraid to have a little fun. Personally, I find there's nothing worse than a boorish assassin. Kayla cracked a laugh herself. Is this man truly an elder? Elder Dre averted his gaze and waved her away. Carry on, Poisoner. I have many thoughts to think. Uh, of course, Elder. Kayla left as quickly as she entered, once again leaving Elder Dre to mull about. 
Truth be told, he was bored. A war was being fought right below his nose, and yet he was forced to sit out on all the fun. One might think being a Doom Faction elder would come with endless freedom, but that could not be farther from the truth. A matter worthy of an elder's attention might wander through the Doom Faction doors every half-century. All other matters were simply trivial. It was for this reason that Elder Dre desired an apprentice in the first place. Yet here he sat, alone in his castle office, completely apprentice-less. Where is that boy, anyhow? Last I heard, he'd lost in battle to that Voslin brat. Uh, what was his name? Plemon? No, no. Nobody's named Plemon. His thoughts would once again be interrupted, this time by a knock on the door. Elder Dre let out as audible of a sigh as he could muster. <sighs> what now? Poisoner? If this is about your real name, I simply jest. Carla, or whatever it was, it's perfectly fine. But behind the door would be none other than Officer Wilhelm Windhorn. Apologies, Dre. I'm fine with the name Poisoner myself. Sounds rather devious. Wilhelm, you old bag of air. I haven't seen that frizzy beard of yours since. Once again, Elder Dre's memory would fail him. The, well, the last time. Wilhelm was well aware of Elder Dre's forgetfulness, as were most of the officers. He certainly did not lack the faculty for memory, but rather the effort to use it. I believe it was ten years ago, at my coronation as head officer of Calandria. Ah, yes, that's right. Well, now have you enjoyed the position? It would certainly be more enjoyable without the war. I mean, who knows? By the end of it, I might be out of a job. How so? Well, if Vaslin wins, Calandria might no longer exist. Elder Dre hadn't even bothered to think of that possibility. Well, that is fair, but I'm sure we'd find a suitable station for you. I never much liked the Vaslin officer. Do you know of him? Not in the slightest. The two men joined in a laugh before the realities of war. Ruin, death, and cruelty intruded on their fun and seeped deep into their minds. Wilhelm took a seat across from Elder Dre. Normally, he was a joyous man, but he quite clearly suffered from a bit of melancholy as of late. His eyes sank low, and his voice took on a bit of hesitation. There is still no word of Nathan? I have not heard. What do you think of it? Has our demon knight of darkness fallen to the great beast known as Hubris? Wilhelm slinked into the back of his chair as he exasperated. Ah, I certainly hope not. He was more than just a talent. I found him to be a delight. It would be an absolute pity to lose him to war. Wilhelm's eyes raised up to Dre's, as if sending a message of their own. A message that would ring loud and clear to Dre. And you wish to help find him? I do. You think I don't? You think I haven't already embarrassed myself in front of the other elders just to make an appearance? Of course you have. I know you value him, as I do. But that's not to say the conversation is at its end. Perhaps the elders might not agree, but quite frankly, do you care? Elder Dre took the full brunt of Wilhelm's words. In many ways, he was right. Elder Dre often relished in acts of antagonism, especially towards the elders. But it was a fickle game. Whether he wanted to admit it or not, he was just as much a politician these days as he was a warrior. Oftentimes, a battle won meant a war lost, a war he might not even be aware of yet but he was quite aware of the war in Calandria. I see your point, but the fact of the matter is, I am a Doom Faction elder, 
Nathan is an unimaginable talent, and we might not see another like him uh, ever again. But wars are not won off the backs of individual talent, and this war, as awful as it might be, is not my war. And it's not yours either, Wilhelm. Wilhelm scoffed. Uh, how boring. The most boring. Welcome to my purgatory. They never let me do anything. Technically, they won't even consider Nathan my apprentice until he passes the annual disciple examination. Can you believe that? How petty. Entirely petty. Wilhelm always enjoyed the casualness Dre carried with him. Long ago, they fought side by side with one another. Even back then, there had never been a moment that Wilhelm wasn't aware of Dre's superior talents. He was the Nathan of his generation. They even took the Doom Trials together. Back then, there had been far less pageantry. One Colosseum, 100 Doom Faction openings, and 1,000 warriors forced to fight for their lives. The very thought sent a shiver down his spine. He lost track of how many warriors died by his own hand then. It was a bloodbath. But Wilhelm clawed his way to the top ten, a victory he still found pride into this day. But Dre had an entirely different experience. By then, the world was already well aware of his strength. The one or two fools, ignorant enough to challenge him, would hardly survive long enough to finish their dueling proclamations. Instead, Dre would run around begging his foes for a fight. He had the same look then as he did now. Complete and utter boredom. He was a war hero born in peacetime, decades too soon to be put to full use. A fate Nathan would not be so lucky to share. Do you think he has a shot to win the annual disciple exam? Dre looked offended, as if the question itself was an insult. Well... He better. Can you imagine the embarrassment I'd face if my very first apprentice was anything less than victorious? I mean, don't get me wrong. It won't be a cakewalk. There is a warrior or two that might actually best him in combat as it stands now. You don't say. I do. One child has some rather peculiar abilities, but I hated the way he smelled. That's why this war needs to end promptly, or I won't have the time to impart my knowledge on the boy. Why not take on the other boy, the one that bested him in battle? They are comparable talents. Slimmon? Uh, I remember him. The Doom faction was quite annoyed about his absence from the trials this year. Many thought him to be the favorite, but he nearly killed the acolyte sent to inform him, and at that point, it was clear Slimmon had little interest in us. Yes, well, I'm pretty sure it's Simon, but regardless, it seems obvious that he had war on the mind from the start, and not everyone values the Doom Faction name as the Calandrians do. Agreed. Besides, I am not yet ready to call him the victor. The two boys have fought twice, one victory apiece. I have to imagine we'll be gifted about to break that tongue. Wilhelm leaned forward, as if to catch Dre in a trap. So you do believe he lives? Dre stroked his beard for a moment before he found an answer. I believe that Nathan Hayfield would never live down defeat. Perhaps he is dead, but I have half the mind to believe that if that were the case, he'd fight through all of hell and raise himself from the grave just to get another shot at it. Nathan Hayfield, back from the grave? Now that would be quite something. Dre sensed doubt in Wilhelm's voice. You may think I jest, but I swear to you, Wilhelm, stranger things have happened on this earth. Not a day after Ebon Forest was burned down, the news had spread like wildfire. Soldiers of a morning expedition the day after 
first noticed the plumes of smoke that had spread out so wide they looked at first like storm clouds. But when the rotund officer leading the morning march saw that these clouds were low and dissipated easily with the wind, suspicions began to creep in. Sure enough, once Ebon Forest was in sight, the soldiers quickly realized that there was no Ebon Forest left to see. All that remained were sharp spikes of charred cinder, some tall and some broken. These were the only things left standing. The boughs and branches had cracked off. Leaves turned to ash. The forest soil was covered in inches of snowy ember. Once, there were trees as tall as giants, stretching out up towards the sun, beings of nature that managed to extend out closest to the heavens. In the course of a night, they had succumbed to ghost fire, reduced to a field of blackened snags along Mount Duel. Upon seeing this sight, the officer called the soldiers to retreat. No longer was this a sordid morning march. It had become a mad sprint back to Sky Hall. Sir! The soldiers called out, but their rotund officer coaxed his horse forward past his own soldiers. His horse heaved under the weight, but he did not care. He coaxed it harder, faster. Sir! His men ran after him, but their words had already become faint. The rotund officer charged along and away on horseback, leaving his men to make their way back on foot. It didn't matter. The officer wanted to be the first to deliver the news. Though it was early morning, bedtime neared for the lanky Vosslian guard. He stifled his yawn the best he could and decided to pace around atop the Sky Hall walls to keep himself awake. He sighed and glanced over into the cluster of buildings that was Sky Hall. Fires for the forges had already been lit, and he saw a line of soldiers forming outside the rations tent. Breakfast. My supper. Uh, I can't wait. He continued pacing, hoping that it would not only ameliorate his fatigue, but also distract him from his hunger. In his more desperate years before conscription, the lanky man had wandered about the streets of Vassinor, scraping by with whatever he could steal. When he was finally caught... The authorities gave him two choices, lose a hand or join the Vosslian army. The man decided his hand was more precious than the freedom to roam Vassinor's underbelly. The guard turned his body to face everything that lay south of Sky Hall. He had obeyed the general's command to discreetly allow a soldier by the name of Ian Kedvin and twelve other soldiers through the gate when the night was still young. Several hours later, he discreetly lifted the portcullis when the soldiers all returned, smelling like smoke, but completely unwounded. The patrolman sighed. Fatigue started to overtake him. He looked around and wondered when the next shift would arrive, when he noticed movement from the corner of his eye. He looked out and squinted. A horse, and a rotund officer riding it, and an urgent expression. As if to cope with the fatigue, the lanky guard allowed himself a modicum of curiosity. What is it now? What lies in the south, exactly? Are we going to be fighting again? Will I have to find a place to hide again? Gates! Open the gates! The guard watched as the rotund officer neared, waving his stubby arms. He yawned again and cranked the lever that raised the portcullis. Though the man looked focused, stoic, and dutiful, he was thinking about one of life's eternal pleasures. Food. If I don't get to eat soon, I'll risk a hand to steal something. A warm soup, maybe. The corporal could not believe his ears. What did you just say? Uh, Ebon Forest, sir. I it's been burned down. In the war tent, General Artemisia and her inner circle of advisors had gathered to listen to the rotund officer's news. All of them looked surprised, with the exception of, of course, 
the general. The corporal couldn't help but wonder if she was even capable of the emotion. Good. Leave us. The rotund officer, sweaty and aching from riding on horseback, frowned. Sir, perhaps I am being too meek with my words. All of Ebon Forest and Ebonfort along with it. It's been reduced to ash. Artemisia did not blink. Yes, you've said it three times now. Leave us. The officer, perhaps hoping to earn a bigger reaction, lingered for a second longer. Then, the thought of disobeying the general crossed his mind, and he lumbered out. The corporal and the other advisors turned their attention to Artemisia. General, did you anticipate this? She crossed her arms and let out a sliver of a smile. I can't say I did, frankly. I thought it would be a futile effort. She gestured to another officer, standing by the tent flaps. Bring me Kedvin, from the 4th Battalion. Nathan grinned to himself. Everything had worked. Everything had gone as planned. And now, not only does Castorone know of my existence, so too does Baylor. Nathan continued to grin as he waited in line for supper. With no battalion out on staggered night marches, the line for supper was exceptionally long. Shortly after supper, Artemisia will step into the feast hall and make an announcement, an announcement declaring me as the soldier who helped burn the forest and Ebon Fort down. After Baylor reached him again, Artemisia had called Nathan to the war tent to personally laud his deeds. Went about as good as I could have imagined it, and now, with Baylor nearby as well, the real counterattack can begin. An inkling of a thought formed. If Baylor is not in Shrouded Cloud City, perhaps, yes, I should ask him myself the next time I speak with him. Nathan stepped forward a smidge in line, moving still at a turtle's pace. Waiting, he silently marveled at Baylor's talent in spiritual telepathy. For him to hone in on Nathan's whereabouts, imbue his thoughts with spiritual aura, and then form this bond, Nathan could not help but be impressed. The level of finesse and clarity was akin to that of a high-level master. And what had been a mere month, had Baylor really managed to grow so powerful? Though Nathan could not muster up the ability to speak telepathically, he thought of his sister and brother-in-law in Shrouded Cloud City. Amelia, Ian, I'll make sure to convey the General's detailed strategies as soon as I get them. Together, we will push back the Vosslian forces. Together, we will prevail. Nathan regained some of his composure. Cool it, Nathan. There's still work left to be done. This all only still works if you continue to play the part. Be the trusty soldier under the general's wing. Then all will be lost. Nathan smiled at the thought of Artemisia's dumbfounded expression. Her countenance twisted in shock as Shrouded Cloud City breaks through the Vosslian encirclement, as Nathan himself, still looking like Ian Kedwin, flies toward her to lop her head clean off. Nathan took a deep breath. I said, keep your calm, Nathan. He patted around his tunic until he felt it. Only two more vials. Two more vials that keep me looking like Ian Kedwin. Nathan knew he could brew more, but he had learned that Vosslians were drawn to smoke in the air, burying a keen obsession with the fires that start in their domain. No stray fire can go unseen. All must be started devoutly, in the name of the Great Forge. It was sheer luck that his brewing when he first arrived in Skyhall went unnoticed. Now, especially with the knowledge of a spy among the ranks, heightened vigilance and an excess of patrolling meant it would be too risky to brew transfiguration potions, even if the alchemy-shy Vosslanders would not know what it was. In any case, I'll just have to be Ian Kedwin for the time being. Patience. Patience is key. I must bide my time, and when the moment is opportune, and it is time to strike, 
I'll be ready. Mason felt his hand tremble a little. It hadn't since he left Ebon Forest, but it started up again, shaking ever so slightly, as if affected by tectonic tremors. Nathan cocked his head and frowned. He felt fine, better than ever, unplagued by the scars of his past, unburdened by the guilt for the fallen. Nathan wasn't sure why his hand started trembling again. Stuart, Sibyl, Farda, Reeve? Nathan shut his eyes in a wince. No, the scars are still there. The guilt is still here. Place a bandage over a wound, and it does not cease to exist. It still aches. It still hurts. Nathan opened his eyes slowly, trained on his trembling hand. And if left untreated, it will fester into something deadly. Nathan gripped his food tray tighter and took another small step forward in line. His stomach grumbled as he focused. One step at a time. One foot at a time. Do it for them, for the fallen that have left scars within me. Attention! Sure enough, during supper, General Artemisia arrived at the feast hall. The Vosleyan soldiers stopped eating at once and saluted. It was unusual for a Vosleyan general to stand amongst her people, so for her to do so telegraphed to everyone that this was important. Nathan watched as a respectful hush fell over the feast hall. More of the general's advisors poured into the hall, standing behind her shoulder to shoulder. Artemisia cleared her throat. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have heard. The rumor mill works fast within our army, does it not? She smiled. Some of the corporals and lieutenants laughed. The Vosselin forces joined in. The general's smile faded as quickly as it came. Some might even say our mouths move faster than our feet. That words spread better than our flames. What do you all think? The laughter died down. Her advisors shared some glances, as if silently chastising each other. A corporal stepped up and yelled at the soldiers. Enough! Who dares laugh in the presence of the general? Artemisia did not acknowledge the corporal as he stepped back in line. She kept her eyes trained on her soldiers, on the men and women who stared back, all of them now waiting nervously for her next words. It is true. Ebon Forest has burned down overnight, but of course, not on its own, and not by divine intervention. She searched the crowd until she found the man with the color for each eye, the soldier she recognized as Ian Cadwin. Last night, a fellow soldier led a group of twelve soldiers into Ebon Forest and left it in ashes. This duty was entrusted to none other than Ian Cadvin. She gestured for Nathan to rise. He obeyed. Applause erupted from behind Artemisia. Soldiers around Nathan started to shout and cheer. Artemisia herself clapped. Artemisia listed out the names of the twelve soldiers who accompanied Nathan. Miranda Drainer, Allard Walrose, and on and on. Applause roared out for each of them. Artemisia held up a hand, and a hush fell over the lively crowd. We've succeeded here, but the war is not yet over. The plan issued the day before remains the same. In two days, we march to Ebon Forest. From there, we surround Shrouded Cloud City. Even from afar, Nathan could see flickering flames reflected in the general's eyes. Then, as their food supply runs dry, we watch the last of the Skylanders go at each other's throats. The attention Nathan didn't care for, but the trust he had earned among the Voslanders, he did. Once Artemisia had left the feast hall, the soldiers crowded him, Miranda, and Allard, as well as the ten others who had shot fire arrows dipped in ghost fire solution 
to burn ebon forest into a smoking dark crisp. How did you know about ghost fire? What ingredients do you need to make it? How many arrows did you have to fire? Did the Calandrian filth fire back? Did you see them burn alive? Did they scream for their mothers and wish they'd never been born? What about Ebonfort? I heard it was an iron fortress hidden within the forest. I heard that it was an underground lair, and only a single trap door covered under a bed of soil would lead into it. The bombardment of questions rained on them like volleys of fire arrows. Nathan addressed each question the best he could, but with his own supper finished, he had to find a way to extricate himself from the questioning mob and bring the Duchess her supper. There was much to discuss. She didn't even know about the state of Ebon Forest yet. Nathan fielded a few more questions, and, to his surprise, he could already feel the excitement and curiosity of the soldiers simmering down. Most of them, he figured, were just relieved that they wouldn't have to risk their lives to fight a battle against soldiers guarding Ebonfort. The image of enemies perched in the tall branches, raining arrows down at them, had probably plagued their souls with worry. Nathan and his small team wiped away that worry like a fine cloth over a muddy boot. Other soldiers, Nathan figured, were simply exhilarated to be in the presence of people the general lauded. Some also just needed the celebration as a means to distract themselves from being away from home, the constant threat of death, the war of it all. Nathan also felt others further away in the mess hall, shooting envious looks towards him. They all must be thinking, it should have been me. Nevertheless, Soldiers gradually scattered after, tossing their fill of questions. Their curiosities sated, and bellies filled. They returned to the usual humdrum of things. But unlike the usual dreary, weary mean, it seemed to suffocate all those that contributed to it, the feast hall of soldiers had an air of festivities. People chattered amongst themselves. They smiled, laughed. Some even brought out the ale they had been brewing in secret, and imbibed until they were dancing on the tables. Nathan smiled. A soldier's most happy when he doesn't have to fight. Funny, isn't it? Miranda sat down next to him, sipping some of the moonshine. Nathan nodded, then nudged Miranda's shoulder. You seemed quite eager to fight. I, and I still am. But as much as we learn at an early age to give our bodies for the good of Vaseline... Our bodies are still our bodies. They are our mighty shell that shelters our scared little souls. Are you drunk, Miranda? She gave a toothy grin and took another swig. Do you want some? For the ghost fire extraordinaire, the grand arsonist of Ebon Forest. I'm sure those ratty soldiers have left you a cup or two. No need. I partake in enough vices. Miranda raised an eyebrow. Oh, interesting. Do I even dare to ask? Both of them smiled. They watched the soldiers chatter and dance, eat and laugh. Some of them would have died if it weren't for us. We helped preserve life doing what we did. Nathan nodded. Looking at the Voslanders, he was reminded again of a shared humanity. They danced just like how happy Calandrians danced. They laughed in the same way Calandrians did. Slowly, Nathan's dimples faded. The curve of his smile flattened into a sober line as Miranda took another swig of ale. Remember what I asked you about the end of the world? I wonder what all the soldiers will be doing if they're not fighting. Are soldiers still soldiers if there is no war to fight? The Vosland soldier drew deeper into her own thoughts. I wonder what comes after all this. Nathan sat with her a little longer, until she fell asleep on his shoulder. He picked her up and laid her gently to rest in her cot. Before he stepped out, he looked at the feast hall in its entirety. The festive mood had also faded. 
After the shapeless blur of happiness smeared away, all that remained was the realization that no amount of booze could make soldiers forget they were still at war. What they were fighting for was a question they had to answer for themselves. Nathan already knew his answer. I could hear clamoring through the stone. What terrible event has transpired? Nathan dropped a tray of meatloaf under the iron bars to the Skylander Duchess. Though she hadn't eaten the night before, the Duchess was famished, not for supper, but for information. Ebenfort, it has fallen. A crease appeared over Duchess Nomora's forehead. What do you mean? A mission was given to burn a forest of giant trees to the ground. It was carried out, concluding as a resounding success by me. The Duchess's eyes narrowed. You acted on your own? I had to. Artemisia gave me no time to meet and inform you. I could not say no. Nathan could feel the intensity of the Duchess's stare grow. Like the sun's rays, if concentrated enough, it alone could start a forest fire. This was not part of the plan. I've been thinking of a way to hinder the Vaslian army, but we cannot do it. They are moving out so soon to Shrouded Cloud City. Not to worry, milady. I've set in motion plans as well. First, you should know that no one in Ebenfort perished in the fire. Commander Castorone and his men retreated at my behest through the secret passageway to Shrouded Cloud City. The Duchess frowned. How? Being in charge gave me some leeway. As soon as I could... I flew to Ebenfort to warn them of the dangers. I've asked them to deliver a copy of your message to your sister and carry word that you still live. According to Castorone, my sister, Amelia Hayfield, and her husband, Ian Lightstone, command a joint Calandrian force within the city, with more help on the way. Duchess Nomura let this news sink in. This is still not a proper line of communication. Ah, but it is. Once the Vaslan force stations in the raised land that once was Ebon Forest, I'll have access to the secret passageway. I've already established a set time with Castorone to meet every night. It should suffice, at least, unless Duke Skyler knows of the cave. Willa bit her lip. We have reason to believe that he doesn't. As the Duke, he'd never been very interested in the forest and the military research done within. That said... We also can't rule out the possibility that Artemisia already knows of the town's existence. Nathan nodded. I'll be careful. You think you have earned the general's trust, then? I do. You'll need to know the precise strategy, exactly where she'll be, where every single soldier will be. I will. Sounds like you're our only hope now, young Hayfield. If you don't unearth Artemisia's plan of attack, we won't have a counterattack and all will be lost. I mean it. With Ebon Forest gone, everything will be lost if Shrouded Cloud City is taken. Nathan nodded assuredly. I won't let you down. I won't let any of us down. Duchess Nomura picked up her supper and began to eat. As she ate, she continued to ruminate. Well, one more thing. If Artemisia plans to encircle Shrouded Cloud City, we might be able to find another wedge to break the formation. Duke Skyler has probably convinced the general that he holds enough sway to keep them at bay, but he's wrong. If we can do this, we might be able to beat the Vaslian army ourselves. Willa crouched and drew on the ground with the butt of her spoon. Nathan crouched and watched as Willa explained further. When Nathan arrived at the abandoned stable, Artemisia was already there waiting for him. Good work. Uh, thank you, sir. Did you relay the news to our captive duchess? Perhaps the sort of the majestic forest reduced to ash might have teased something out of her. Nathan shook his head. Uh, I've relayed the news, but the duchess remains stolid like a rock. Did you impress upon her that it was you who burned the fort and the forest down? Uh, I did. 
and she did not bat an eye? She grabbed her meal, turned away, and ate. Artemisia paced, stroking her chin. In any case, keep chiseling away. The Duchess is like a block of unpolished limestone. At the core, there are valuable gems to unearth. I want to unearth them all, and soon. She'll be traveling with us to Ebenfort. We'll find a place there to keep her in seclusion. I want you, using more forceful methods, to tease a response out of her. Nathan nodded. He clenched his fist as it began to tremble. Do you understand me, Kedvin? Uh, I do. I want the Duchess broken. I don't care if you rip out her teeth and fingers. I don't care what terrible acts you must commit to. She hides too much. I want her chiseled open until all is laid bare. Uh, Will do, sir. The general studied Nathan with a gaze similar in intensity to the Duchess. Nathan looked down at his greaves, feigning submission until she looked away. He heard the general sigh. Ah, good work with Ebon Forest. I didn't know you possessed such alchemical intellect. But you must be wary of the information you share. Remember, there is a spy among us. Nathan remained absolutely still. I spoke only of Ghostfire to you and your advisors, sir. I do not know how word got out so quickly. Nathan's mind raced. If you allow me to be present in the war meetings, General, I can find the rat. He waited as Artemisia pondered the request. She began to pace. Perhaps. I was going to ask you to join in once we made it to Ebenfort anyhow. Like I said before, trust is a rare commodity during times like these. You don't have to trust me, General. But I'll do whatever you ask. I'll sniff out the rat. Artemisia's lips cracked in a smirk. You'll be my dog. I will. By the time Nathan returned to the feast hall, most of the soldiers had fallen into a drunken slumber. A few spoke in hushed voices by the fire, but they paid Nathan no heed as he slipped into his cot and closed his eyes. He counted the seconds, and then, as the agreed-upon time came, Nathan felt a slight distortion in the air, a bond of spiritual telepathy. Baylor's voice seeped into his mind. Bastion, it's Grey Tide. Nathan smiled. For extra caution, they'd established code names in case the bond could be intercepted. With everything that had caught Nathan off guard as of late, he figured an extra bit of vigilance couldn't hurt. A little more accustomed to the telepathy, Nathan spoke with just his mind. Grey Tide, have you made it back to Shrouded Cloud City somehow? I haven't. I fear I won't be able to, with all exits closed. How are things in Sky Hall, Bastion? Swimmingly. Scouts have decreased in number, so you should be able to roam more freely. Soon, the Vosslin forces will make a company move to Ebenfort. Understood. In the meantime, can I entrust you with a task? Of course. Nathan smiled. He heard a shiver in Baylor's reply, but also an eagerness. This comes from the Duchess herself. There are potential allies across the outskirts of Skylerland. Allies you must recruit for the Calandrian cause. I'll tell you where now. A hooded figure rode up to the gatehouse of Vassinor. Halt! The guards raised their crossbows, stopping the rider. The new captain of the gatehouse was under strict orders not to let anyone through who didn't have the proper papers. During peacetime, Vassinor was heavily monitored, but during wartime, it was easier to pull off one's own toenails then slip into Vosslin's capital unnoticed. The cloaked figure didn't raise their hood, nor did they say a single word. All they did was lift a single arm. In their gloved hand, they held an unmistakable badge. The captain's eyes widened. 
She motioned hastily to the other guards. Let them through! The soldiers lowered their crossbows, and the rider galloped onward. The streets of Vasenor were much different than they had been even a month or so before. Most out-of-town traders had deserted the city, and many young people had left with the army. Left behind were those who performed civic functions, the elderly, the infirmed, and children. This left quite an array of people within the city, but it still felt deserted. An air of gloom hung over the capital, as if the city itself were already mourning her own lost souls. The stable doors opened, and the hooded rider dismounted his horse. He led his creature to the stable hand, who dutifully accepted his coin and put the horse in a paddock. Before the cloaked person left, something caught their attention. In the back of the stable, a horse whinnied and neighed, almost as if in protest. The cloaked figure approached and beheld the chestnut-colored steed. Its eyes darted back and forth, and it snorted derisively. The stable hand went up to the hooded person. Sir, worry not with that mount. She's in royal custody, impounded from the enemy, if you will, ever since his mount was shot from off his back. The stranger reached out a hand and stroked the horse on its side. You need to let him wander, breathe the outdoor air again. Afraid not, sir. Not without royal orders. Ah, you still should. This beast is in mourning. With their horse stowed away, the cloaked figure walked toward the palace. They stopped in the main square and looked away from the main building. In front of the castle, there was a plaza. In the center of the plaza rested a fountain. A man sat on the fountain, in simple but well-maintained black clothes with silver buttons. He wrote notes in a book. Sitting next to him was a cane. The hooded figure approached. Without looking up from his book, Dunstan spoke. It took you long enough, brother. The figure stopped. A laugh resonated from within the hood. <laughs> Nothing could pass thee, does it, Dunstan? Not if I can help it. The cloaked man removed his hood, revealing the face of Clement Perrin. Thou have been hard at work, I see. Dunstan looked up at his younger brother and smirked. If you can see my hard work, then I haven't been doing a good job of it, have I? Dunstan and Clement sat on a bench in a public park. The flowers and hedges were well trimmed, as were the siblings' exchanges with each other. Growing up under such a tyrant as Duke Thomas Perrin was a process that left a fair number of scars on the survivors, as was the case with every one of the Perrin brothers. Though Dunstan liked Clement more than he liked any of his other siblings, there was still an odd formality to the way they approached each other. Duke Thomas forbade signs of love and affection between his family members, and no matter how much they tried, shaking years of habits was not something that could be accomplished in a fortnight. So you failed in your Herald's Land mission, I hear. Clement nodded, looking away. Dunstan moved to pat his brother on the shoulder, but an unseen force held him back. The memory of being whipped by his father for crying haunted him. Aye, it was a demon knight of darkness. It appears our initial suspicions that he would devote his focus to the Doom faction was... Mm, inaccurate. Dunstan nodded. That is true. But now, father has his war. He, Simon, and Artemisia have never been happier, I reckon. They have never been more insufferable, you mean. They chuckled to each other. And you made it out of Herald's Land with your hide. A worthy success, if not a strategic one. Were you able to glean any insight into the Northern Eye? That it is vast and nearly unparalleled, and that they know your true occupation. Dunstan stared. For years... He had endeavored to keep his motives to himself, 
which was not too hard to do. If the Northern Eye did know about Dunstan's spy network, that meant they knew more than every fiefdom in Vosselin and Calandria did. Dunstan gritted his teeth. There was nothing more distasteful than the idea that other people knew more of him than he did of them. Clement noticed his brother's discomfort and couldn't help but chuckle. <laughs> well, at least you are finally being recognized for your effort. Dunstan rolled his eyes. We are not like spiritual warriors, Clement. There are two types of spy masters in this world. Those that no one knows exist, and dead ones. They talked further, Clement relating the episode in Harold's Land. The only detail he changed was how his duel with Hagar ended. Clement invented a fanciful story of escaping from the Harold's Land dungeons, which seemed at least plausible. From Dunstan's absorbed expression, it seemed to be believable, and it erased any suspicion his sibling might have that he had ulterior motives. Or at least, he thought it did. The tricky thing about Dunstan was that it was never easy to tell what he was thinking based on his expression alone. Why did you come here, Clement? Wherefore did you not go home to father in parents' hall? I did, initially. Which is why it took me so long to arrive. Our homeland is now completely dedicated to the war. It's remarkable, seeing all the forges alight. All our industry working as if there's no tomorrow. It's like watching a dragon awaken after centuries of slumber. Dunstan nodded. Lothar had related similar tales via letters. I wish... I wish Mother had lived to see it. Dunstan deliberately turned away at this point. There were very few plans he had ever put in place which caused him any twinge of regret. This was one of them. Of all the five Perrin brothers, Dunstan was the only one who knew that their mother, Lucrezia, still lived. His eyes glazed over as he remembered the day that their family had been broken forever, 16 years ago. You told me he was a boy! Veins bulged on Duke Thomas Perrin's red forehead as he shouted at his wife. Lucrezia gestured rapidly to the servants standing by in the kitchen, but none moved. None of them dared risk the wrath of Duke Thomas. Tears rolled down Lucrezia's cheeks. I... I only wanted you to be happy. You wanted me to be happy? You wanted me to be happy? The God of the Forge tells us that no one lies like a crack within a breastplate. You can hammer it flat all you like, but eventually the damage will wreak its own revenge. But you got what you wanted. A son. Not a son. A perversion. You had no interest in raising a child to knit cook or be used as a pawn in a marriage game. So why would you care now? She fights as well as the boys. She's much stronger at ten than Stephen is. The Duke lunged forward and grabbed his wife by the face, silencing her. Her weeping eyes looked at each servant's face. Though she couldn't speak, anyone within sight could behold that she was asking for help. The servants looked down at their feet. They all wished to aid her and yearned to save her from the monster that was her husband. But none of them could. Fear held them tighter than a vice made of nether steel. One person returned her gaze. It was six-year-old Dunstan, leaning on his tiniest of crutches. Even as a child, he couldn't walk fully upright without assistance. But that didn't stop him. He hobbled forward and shouted at his father, Leave my mother alone, you brute! Keeping his hand on Lucrezia's mouth, the Duke turned around slowly, staring daggers at his child. Lucrezia's eyes widened in horror. No, Dunstan, d d don't! But Dunstan cared not. Though his legs quaked and his heart pounded, he stood at his full diminutive height. His father slowly spoke. What did you call me, Brent? 
Little Dunstan gulped. I called you a brute. Duke Thomas lashed out instantly, smacking his son across the cheek. Dunstan flew backward, crying out in pain. His mother screamed. Thomas Perrin whirled back on his wife and struck her in the side with his fist. The Duchess's scream disappeared as her face remained contorted in agony. She fell to the floor, clutching her side. The preteens Stephen and Artemisia rushed in. Dunstan cried out for help, but his siblings ignored him. Instead, they rushed straight to their mother's side. Duke Thomas glowered over the whole scene. The Duchess spent a week in the infirmary before disappearing without a trace. Most suspected the Duke had killed her, but the only people who knew otherwise were the faithful servants of Lucrezia herself. Ever the persistent child, Dunstan followed them as they moved the broken body of their mistress to her tower. For the subsequent sixteen years, there she remained, and when he came of age, Dunstan took charge of her health and her vengeance. Clement watched his brother's eyes go vacant in the midst of a reverie. He sighed. His mind, too, was whirring with conflict. He was now under the thumb of the Northern Eye, with one explicit task, send them intelligence. If he refused to do so, then they would swiftly end his life. Clement loved his country, but as a teenager with a whole life ahead of him, he loved his own life more. As far as he could reason, there was no better way to do that than by spying on his brother, the spy. War is complicated. It's only during the heat of battle that things are simple. Dunstan stood. I'm sorry, brother. I was lost in thought. What were you saying? Clement stood alongside him. I came here to assist you. Father and the others are embroiled in their war. So I figured... It could not hurt for you to have a brother by your side. Dunstan smiled, a weary smile. Clement continued his remarks. And I'm sorry to say this, but you really look awful. Dunstan laughed, rubbing his eyes. I haven't been sleeping well since the war began, or just before it. Will you take me? I have some experience in disguises now, and my feet can tread where yours are limited. Dunstan lifted his hand. It stopped partway in its journey, the horror of a father's cruel hand trying to hold it at bay. Dunstan shook his head, dispelling the absent influence of his father's decree. He placed his hand on his little brother's shoulder. It would delight me to work side by side with you, my brother. Now... Let us feed you. No use trying to work on an empty stomach. I hope you won't fault me for leaning on you. Of course not. Lean away, Dunstan. Dunstan took his brother's arm and limped alongside him. Off the two brothers walked, back toward Vassinor's keep, side by side, arm in arm, and lie in lie. In the midst of Godric's land, there sat a town. Its name was unimportant though many people knew it. In some countries, it would have been called a city, for thousands of people did call it home, and yet it was still just a town. War raged in the east. A multitude of the youthful citizens of Godric's land had already marched north to Hayland in order to reinforce the Azure Fortress, yet in this town, life moved on as usual. Farmers tilled their fields, masons repaired broken walls, Gardeners clipped their hedges. Gong farmers tended to the night soil in the privy. Young people still made merry mischief of all kinds, from pulling pranks to taking each other out behind the barn to play more sophisticated games than they did as children. And most nights, men and women congregated at a pub. On this occasion, with war raging and politics threatening to tear the outside world apart, some traveling minstrels had arrived. The townsfolk relished this opportunity, for it was easy enough to hear the words of abroad from letters or decrees from Duke Godrickson or King Cyrus II himself, but to hear such news from minstrels 
was to feel the news. Claudette Fronsac led the tune. As her band played behind her, she strummed her lute and sang a lilting ditty. It was one of her favorite compositions. It told a tale of Nathan Hayfield, the demon knight of darkness, how he rose from the ashes of his death and fought the house raven, destroying the foes that would have sought to ruin his family. As she sang, sweat trickled down her face. Performance was no easy task. In Claudette's mind, it required her full commitment, which meant physical and emotional exertion. When finally the song came to a close, the assembled townsfolk rapturously applauded. Claudette led her band in a bow. She downed a mug of ale. Now, would you like to hear another tale of the Demon Knight of Darkness? The audience cheered. Her band readied themselves. Claudette nodded to them. She was just about to start playing when a single, solitary voice cried out from the corner. I would not. The musicians stopped, startled. This was the first time in the last year that someone had objected to them playing a song about the hero from Dunshire. Other bar patrons booed. A mischievous twinkle lit up in Claudette's eyes. She winked at her band. Then she hopped up from the stage onto a table, holding her hands up. Now, now. We all have differing opinions on what makes a compelling song. Claudette normally wouldn't engage with hecklers, but she felt herself in a playful mood that day. And if she could get some entertainment out of a bit of banter, she certainly was not above that. What is your objection to us playing a song about Nathan? The patron stood. He was a lean, balding man with a gray mustache and goatee. He had the weary look of a scholar about him. His stories are always about the same thing, are they not? The Hayfield boy confronts a powerful warrior. The powerful warrior underestimates him. Then he triumphs. We've heard it how many times? Some of the crowd members laughed at this. Claudette shrugged. I cannot control the flow of events, good sir. I simply make them rhyme. The balding man continued. You object, but in a year, these songs of the Hayfield boy's power will be dull to the ear. How often can we sing the praises of a man whose very presence heralds violence and death wheresoe'er he travels? A couple of people shouted to booze, and more still laughed. But Claudette could hear murmurs of assent from the crowd. She hopped over to a second table, carefully measuring her boots' stride so it didn't knock over any mugs of ale. Our wise master here has a point. We love the stories of heroes, but who among us would like to be part of one, I? The whole bar laughed uproariously, and just as the laughter began to subside, the critic spoke again. My daughter competed in the Doom Faction trial with Nathan Hayfield. She never made it home. The bar silenced. Claudette felt her heart pang with regret. She hopped down from the table. Well, sir, I cry your mercy. She thought for a moment. We shall never be starved for songs of the Hayfield boy, but as it so happens... I have a song of mine that I just finished writing that touches on this theme. Would you like to hear it, sir? The balding man nodded. Claudette turned to the rest of the crowd. Would you all like to hear it? Clapping of approval sounded throughout the bar. Claudette turned and nodded to her band. One of them plucked out notes on a harp. The tune was sad. Come, kind friends and lovers, my world around me. Come, gather our flowers and pay our respects. We have not the time to share all too kindly to the ones forgotten by war. Henrietta Weaver lay naked on a bedroll, 
the cold air stinging her skin from outside. Her lover of the night was sprawled alongside her, asleep. She sighed to herself and stood, grabbing her clothes from off the canvas ground. Sometimes her clients provided warmth throughout the night, and sometimes only in the heat of a few passionate moments. On a cold night such as this, she was thankful that this officer at least wasn't as tight-fisted with his coin as he was with the sheets. Fully dressed, she slipped out through the open tent flap. The winter breeze nearly sliced through her gown, but she pulled her shawl tightly over her shoulders and walked through it. Her boots sunk ever so slightly into the damp ground. Her tent was posted 42 paces away from the soldiers' camp alongside those of the other women of the ease nearby. She had added two extra paces to the limit that Prince Giacomo gave her. After all, she didn't want to risk the ire of a captain with a particularly long stride, and besides, it was little labor for men or women with nighttime business on the mind to make the slightly longer journey. Torches flickered and flared in the soldier's camp. She had never traveled with an army before, and the thought unsettled her. She had bedded soldiers in the past, but never on the warpath itself. It felt ghoulish, like she was a priestess who came to administer sacred rites over a body before it was taken apart by magic, machinery, or man. It was a distracting thought to bear throughout any sort of intimate encounter, so she tried to shake it. After all, Civilians died every day from many means, sometimes after their own moments of tenderness or passion. But the fact that it was so prepared made her feel uncomfortable in a way that she would never dare voice to her mistress, Primrose. She took a deep breath, filling her lungs with air. One of her partner's remarks floated into her head. To be alive is to be aware death can take you at any moment so why should we not take and give pleasure while it is ours to deal with? She smiled to herself. Their battlefield is one of death. I guess, for the moment, mine is one of life. Temporarily satisfied, she returned to her tent, hoping the man within had relinquished at least some of the blankets. In the unnamed town, Claudette continued her song. Sing of the logger with his rusty pickaxe. Sing of the swing of how he felled that tree. He made every chop seem an easy task as the ones forgotten by war. In Vassinor's library, a browbeaten middle-aged woman rifled through papers. Her hair was black but thin and graying at the temples, she was heavy set, but not unhealthily so. Her physique was more born from a career of poring over papers. This was Marine Leclerc, the assistant of Viscount Sylvester Nori. The Viscount approached her, ever the fast talking lump of robes. Have we the figures for the latest shipment? You know the order is double what they asked for before. I swear, if they continue to tax us at this rate, We'll be run out of business before word can even reach the king. Marine spoke quickly, attempting to match her employer's rapid pace. Aye, that we do, sir. I just finished them. She handed over a sheet of paper. Careful, Viscount. The ink is still... Just then, the Viscount sneezed. <coughs> the force of his blast sent the wet ink smeared across the parchment. Marine's heart sank, hours of work erased by one Viscount's inability to cover his nose. Sylvester Nori seemed unaware of this error. Oh dear, uh, clean that up, will you, Marine? Uh, we need that sent out today. She sighed and murmured her assent. She took the paper back. She had promised her wife and kids that she would be back from work on time this evening. She sat down, dipped her pen in the ink pot, and scrawled the first word. Nether steel imports. In the middle of Godrickshaw, a town prior shouted her news to the bustling crowd. 
Occasionally, a man or woman would acknowledge her and ask follow-up questions. Most of the time, she bellowed her voice raw, trying to get people to hear the news. The last play she saw had a joke about town criers being poor actors. I would love to see an actor do what I do day after day and call it easy. Pretending you're someone else for a mere two hours sounds to me like a holiday. Oh, yes! Oh, yes! Oh, yes! And she rang her bell again. More news from the war. It would be a long night for her, but it was worth it for the people to get their news. It was a quiet night in the Doomed Damsel, the pub within Castle Doom. It had been since the war began, as disciples were gradually granted leave to go fight for their families. Once again, Disciple Hayfield started a trend. First, he left. Then, Morvith, the Haroldson boy. Then, Stuart. Winifred, the barmaid, poured herself a drink. Normally, she didn't indulge at her workplace, but she owed herself at least a treat that night, since this was the night word reached them of Nathan Hayfield's disappearance. I wonder if he remembered our conversation about the destruction wrought by his ilk. She took a slow sip of her ale and then discreetly stowed it under the bar. She looked at the four or five disciples trying to relax after their training. She wondered how many of their comrades would return when this whole bloody affair had ended. Claudette's voice rang out over the tavern. The patrons listened, enthralled by the music. Heroes and legends, warriors and knights, we live in the footprints of stories we tell. Through their love and their wars, the battles they fight, they make us the forgotten of war. When the song ended, silence fell over the tavern. Eventually, one man in the corner started applauding. Then another joined, and soon the entire bar came to life with cheers. Claudette smiled, her mind still occupied with the emotions that had inspired the song. She and the band took a quick bow. The night wasn't over yet. They had more music to perform. Now, who would like to hear the tale of Nathan's battle with the treacherous Simon Perrin? The whole bar cheered, Claudette and the band readied to play. Just as she launched into the first verse, her eyes met those of the critical balding man who demanded a different type of song. A single tear rolled down his cheek. A trio of Vaslan soldiers fled across the snow, leaping over the fallen burnt trees of a forest on the outskirts of Skylerland. They were scouts, looking to stamp out any rural Skylarlanders and claim their resources for the war. But all they would find were arrows. The arrowhead tip jutted out from one of the man's face, right through his eye. He fell to the ground fast, no more alive than the dead foliage around them. Where are they coming from? A second arrow flew from straight ahead, piercing through his throat, as if to silence him. Bernard! No! The final member of the Vosslin scouting troop stood his ground, eyes peeled for his foe with a hatchet in his hand. I'll tear you apart, coward! Fight me like a man! From beneath the snow, covered in a thick white cloak, a tiny figure revealed themselves like a ghost in a graveyard. He was no more than four feet high, or fourteen years old, but he had the eyes of a man-hunter. He reeled back the taut string of his bow as snow fell from his boyish shoulders. Apologies, I am not yet old enough. The Vosslin guffawed. You're a child! His grip tightened on the axe handle as he lowered his head in shame. I didn't join a war to kill children. Fine by me. The young man let loose his arrow without batting an eye. But the Vaslin ducked just in time. As the arrow whizzed past his ear, he charged head on, 
now only a few feet from the boy. He leaped into the air and swung downwards with lethal intent as he roared. But the boy remained unfazed. He felt no fear, for he was not the prey. An arrow pierced the guard from behind, straight through his spine. The force carried him a few feet while in the air and sent him crashing to the ground. He found himself unable to move. This was not the result of poison, but rather a well-placed arrow through his nerves. I, I can't feel my legs, my arms. <laughs> How? I, I dodged. The words drooled out of his mouth and into the snow. His mind was consumed with the fear that he failed to control his own body. The young boy knelt down, his face as expressionless as ever, and flipped the man onto his back. As he did, the arrow dug deeper through the man's chest, and the child pulled the arrow up out of his ribcage as he screamed. Ah! You'll live. He scoffed, knocked the bloody arrow into his bow, and launched it up towards the sky. It ascended upwards into the heavens, far enough to disappear behind the clouds. My spirit stalking arrow only misses if I wish it to. Right now, I wish for it to land here. He poked the man at the center of his forehead. I can heal your wounds with a potion, but only if I believe your answers to my questions. You, you wouldn't. You're just a kid. The kid looked at him, perplexed. Of course I would. I already killed two of your friends and robbed you of your body. Now, what are you doing here? The guard stared up at the hazy gray sky. Still no sign of the arrow. I'm, I'm a scout looking for resources, shelter, enemies. The boy arched an eyebrow. And did you find any? In the distance, the Vosselin saw a small black dot emerging. The arrow. He picked up the pace in his voice. No, none at all. We found nothing. Good. No reason to come back, right? But what happened to your friends? The black dot grew in size, crashing down faster and faster to the earth. Uh, they died. Bear attack. No, no, no. Someone might come to bury the bodies or hunt the bear. Can't have that. <laughs> Fear sunk in as the arrow's details grew more clear. White goose feathers, a shaft made from ash, and a razor-tipped steel arrowhead. He spewed words like the sick do bile. Uh, they fled. They couldn't handle the war, so they ran. He closed his eyes as they filled with tears. I tried to stop them, but they struck me down. His life had flashed before his eyes, not one he could be proud of either. But when he opened them, the arrow had vanished from thin air. The boy stood over him. Good. I'll fetch you a potion. Oh, thank the forge god. I praise thee. As the child walked away, he called out behind him. Oh, by the way, how many of you were there? Uh, just three, I swear. The arrow pierced him through the side of his skull. His executioner let out a heavy sigh before unleashing another arrow towards the wilderness. It flew through the forest, weaving between the blackened branches of burnt trees. Twenty yards away, the arrow twisted behind the thick trunk of a pine and emerged on the other side with the slain body of a fourth Vosslin scout. I hate liars. Baylor was completely lost. Ever since he left his cave, he found nothing but snow-white fields and forests claimed by fire. As far as he knew, he'd been traveling in circles for hours. He was short of a Skylarland map, not that he could read it anyway. Perhaps Nathan had not realized how cruel it was to ask Baylor, a blind man, 
to navigate his way through unknown lands for allies. But Baylor was adamant he'd find a way to solve this problem, just as he did the problems before. It had become something of a specialty. At the very least, his recent growth in spiritual energy allowed him to maintain the demonic gaze for a great period of time. A few hours of use became a trivial task once he got his bearings. Without it, he would not have recognized the cold corpses of four Vaslin men nearby. Baylor could tell each soldier died from a well-placed arrow. Perhaps more than well-placed, they were perfectly aimed. Even the most skilled of archers could hardly boast perfect accuracy in the heat of battle. He could tell they were Vaslin by the feel of their armor. The nether steel pricked against his spiritual energy like a barbed thistle. Baylor knelt down to feel the skin of the dead, a hint of warmth below their skin. They passed recently. He extended his gaze wide and far in search of any threat, but there was nothing to find. At the very least, this means I should find some Skylarlanders in the direction these men fled from. So, Baylor marched forward, vigilant of any stray arrows. This was war. That meant anyone was subject to an assault. Baylor knew of his allegiances, but a stranger might have their doubts. As he walked forward, with nothing but the sound of his own feet as they shuffled through the snow, he questioned what results would come of this mission. Not many men would follow a stranger into war, let alone a blind one. Still, he felt there might be less resistance than if they had known the Baylor of old. At least now, he could demonstrate strength. Not the strength of a world-ender, like Nathan, but that of a worthy brother of arms. As the thought crossed his mind, a smile crossed his face. But up ahead, a gnarled tree trunk bore a message, crudely carved on its hide. Leave. Alas, Baylor the Blind was not the best of readers, so he moved on without notice. It was for this reason he would be greeted by an arrow. Baylor felt it cut through the air, drew his sword, and cleaved it in two. He honed his demonic gaze to uncover its origin, but before he could, another arrow flew towards him from the side. He ducked as it flew over his head. It came from a completely different angle. More than one archer, perhaps? But as he finished the thought, he could feel the arrow turn around mid-air. It came after him with immense speed, too fast for him to strike down. Thus, he'd be forced to dodge yet again. No, just one with great talent. A second and third arrow flew towards him, each one from a different direction tinged with a hint of spiritual aura. Baylor sprinted forward and cut down the first and managed to eke away from the second with only a glancing cut. Meanwhile, the other arrow he dodged prior had already circled back for another attempt, but with a quick spin of the blade, he ended its flight. These arrows, they strike like birds of prey. I must find their nest. With only one arrow left to deal with, Baylor had time to focus. He let Aura ooze from his soul and into the forest, waiting for the smallest disturbance. It worked. He felt the faintest bit of spiritual aura spike from close by. Baylor dashed towards the source, knowing it meant an arrow was rocketing toward him, but he shattered its flimsy shaft with ease. A small figure rose from the snow as Baylor was hot on his tail. It tried to flee, but Baylor lunged forward, tackling the enemy into a nearby tree trunk, his blade at the archer's throat. Baylor arched his head to the side just in time to dodge the final arrow as it lodged itself in the tree, just behind the archer's face. That's a neat trick, but I'm afraid you chose the wrong opponent. You... you're... Calandrian? His voice squeaked, as all prepubescent boys do. And you are a child. I'm 13 years old. You're hardly my elder. Baylor loosened his grip 
and sheathed his blade. A fair point, though a lot can happen in two years' time. The boy averted Baylor's blind eyes. I've experienced plenty already. His cold, emotionless tone led Baylor to believe him. What is your name? Are you from Sky Hall? My name is Paul. I never lived in the city. But you live nearby? In the woods? I do. How many of you are there? One. Baylor could feel the loneliness pour out of Paul's body. He wondered how long it had been since he'd last seen an ally. Perhaps it was time he made one. Would you mind adding one more for the night? It will get dark soon, and truth be told, I have no idea where I am. Paul let out a laugh, but cut it off quickly, like he knew not where it came from. Uh, I guess it couldn't hurt. I have some rabbit we could eat. Baylor let out a chuckle of his own. Of course, it was rabbit. But I just ate rabbit. Haven't you Skylarlanders anything else to eat? Paul looked down to his feet. No, afraid not. Baylor gripped his shoulder as Nathan had gripped his in the past. A gesture of comfort. This boy was hardly older than Baylor had been when he first trained as a spiritual warrior. But he was strong. Strong enough to survive a war without help. This boy and his bow took down fully grown men like they were deer. Rabbit will do just fine, Paul. Paul brought Baylor to a small shack half buried under the snow. In one corner of the room was a pile of partially frozen hay covered in a mound of blankets. At the other end was a small stone hearth. It was the bare minimum, but it was all Paul ever had. You live here? My father built it for us. He's gone now. Mother, too. Naturally, Baylor pondered what had to happen for this child to be left alone, and for how long he'd been so, but he knew better than to ask that of a stranger. How far out from town is this? There are a couple of villages nearby, Bouldersby and Walu, maybe a day's journey through the snow. Are there capable men there? My allies in the south require reinforcements for the war. Perhaps. I don't know the people. Baylor was no stranger to loneliness. He often found himself without company. At times, he dwelled on the thought. But as of late, even in his loneliest moments, he found solace in his duties. Solitude was hardly a price to pay when war was on the line. How have you survived on your own for this long? Paul pulled open a hatch on the ground. Inside was a container half full of frozen rabbits. He pulled one out and started to skin its hide, a task he'd clearly done time and time again. I've been through worse. I was in the Doom Trials. At your age? That's impressive. Those trials nearly killed me. I almost qualified. Number 101 but the Doom Faction does not believe in consolation prizes. Indeed. Baylor watched as Paul expertly prepared the rabbit meat and lathered it in salt and a few Schuyler Land seasonings that Baylor hadn't been privy to in his cave. He skewered it on a stick, whittled it down for a roast, started a fire with the same effort it took one to brush their teeth, and cooked the meat to perfection. It was a simple meal, but the boy had perfected the process. A life alone and full of tragedy seemed to have bolstered Paul's soul. Baylor couldn't help but feel within the presence of a middle-aged man. But, presence or not, he was still a boy, and boys do not belong in war. Baylor contemplated how helpful Paul might be, not just as a guide, but an ally on the battlefield. He hated himself for those thoughts. Even though Baylor had not yet turned 16, his conscience could not allow him to directly involve those younger than him. He should be ready now. 
he handed Baylor his half, sat down, and waited to see Baylor's first bite. Baylor nearly cried. This was nothing like his last dining experience. Sure, it was the same meat that touched his tongue prior, but it was no simple act of survival. This was a homemade meal. He still knew it to be meat, and he still had reservations about eating another creature, but at least this meal had been prepared with care and intent. Paul, you are as talented a cook as you are an archer. Paul shrugged, as if he never thought cooking to be a talent. I cook a lot of rabbit. For a moment, they simply ate in silence and enjoyed the company. I cannot thank you enough for this meal. Yeah, well, you didn't kill me. That was nice of you. Paul ate his food like a starved wolf, only coming up for air after the bones had been picked clean. Baylor hardly took three bites before the rabbit disappeared entirely. Once he was finished, he tossed the bones into a small cauldron, packed to the brim with snow, and placed it over the hearth. Paul recognized the look of confusion on Baylor's face and felt obliged to explain. Boiled bones make good soup. You don't say. Where are you from? Hayland. He couldn't help but smirk as the words left his mouth. Even then, it felt weird to say. Nathan Hayfield's fiefdom? The one and the same. He's a dear friend. Do you know him? We crossed paths in the Doom Trial. He beat me. He beats everyone. Don't take it personally. I shot at him from the trees, as all Skylanders do, but then he took the trees from me, cleaved them in a single blow. Then he found me, and he spared my life. So I learned not to rely on trees. I'm a fast learner. Good thing, too. There aren't many alive these days. Just a lot of strangers with fire. Paul looked up at him with ice-cold eyes. What are you doing here? A question Baylor did not wish to answer. He looked around at the room, the bunny box, the hearth, all built by the boy's father. How could he take him from his home and throw him into the front lines of war? I'm just passing through. I don't like liars. Baylor swore he felt a killer's intent seep out from the boy, but it fled just as soon as it arrived. Baylor caught a whiff of smoke. Do you smell that? Paul sniffed the air. His eyes snapped open as he rushed to the door and nearly ripped it off its hinges. His stare locked onto the horizon as he grabbed his snow coat and bow. They're back. Then he was gone. Baylor felt the encroaching presence of Vosland soldiers, eight, perhaps nine in total. Each one's armor pricked at his aura, just as the nether steel of their fallen comrades had. But even as Baylor used his demonic gaze, there was no sign of Paul. A handful of flame-tipped arrows just out from the roof of Paul's hut. But Baylor had no time for fire. The enemy was already upon him. The Vosland soldiers stood only a dozen yards away when Baylor called out to them. Heed my warning, Voslanders. There shall be no mercy beyond this point. The Voslanders shot looks at one another before sharing an uproarious laugh. He found himself alone once again. Had it not been for the rabbit in his belly, Baylor might have thought that Paul never existed. For all he knew, the child fled, and by all means, he hoped so. It was clear as the Hayland sky that Paul was a prodigal talent, but he was still small and frail. If at any point stealth or distance were not in his favor, Baylor feared he would fall. Agreed, Skylalanda. Mercy fled your lands long ago. Your death will not be as quick as our allies had been. One of the burlier soldiers stood forward. Instead of a nether steel shield, it seemed this combatant opted for a two-handed mace. 
their armor was adorned with scrapes and minor imperfections. He does not look like much. I can end this alone. Baylor thought for a moment how Nathan might take this opportunity to goad the soldiers further, but he lacked the same comedic wit as his friend, as well as the endless confidence required to wield it. Instead, Baylor silently readied his blade. He sensed a large discrepancy between them in the spiritual aura that favored him, but if they proved greater than the sum of their souls, it would be a hard-fought victory. The mace-wielder charged forward with their bulky bludgeon at the ready. She swung with reckless abandon, only an impenetrable suit of armor would allow, but that sense of safety would be her weakness. Baylor evaded the hefty attacks with ease. Knowing better than to strike against the nether steel needlessly, he could not penetrate the alloy without Amelia's potions. But all armor has gaps. Where the breastplate met the waistline was a natural weakness, normally shored up by a simple chain mail normally made of iron. Compared to the unbreakable nether steel, iron was fragile. The soldier wielded the mace high above their head, intending to crash down upon Baylor's skull as a finishing blow. But Baylor would not be the one to fall. The tip of his blade lodged precisely between the enemy's pieces of armor. Blood poured down the soldier's nether steel plated legs. Ah! She fell to the ground as she gripped her fresh wound, alive but unable to fight. Without a moment's notice, three more charged forward, while two on each side flanked Baylor. Baylor suspected the frontal assault was intended to push him back and force an opening. Thus, to respond with an attack of his own was the least expected and most potent tactic. He charged forward, dodging a panic swing from the first Vosselin, and responded with a slash through the neck. Yet another vulnerability. But the other Vosselin that rushed head-on used the opportunity to the best he could. Had he struck a man with normal vision, it might have worked. But Baylor's demonic gaze gave him plenty of warning to evade the man's backstab and respond with a lethal encounter. Two dead soldiers, one critically wounded. It was going well. But in the aftermath, the flanking soldiers were given time to form a ring around Baylor, one at his north, south, east, and west, completely surrounded. They rose their swords in unison as a purple haze emanated from their blades, enveloping the air until a makeshift spiritual barrier was formed around Baylor. Careful, boys. He's got eyes in the back of his head. We'll crush him beneath our barrier. In unison, they carefully closed in on the blind man, one step at a time. Baylor slashed wildly against the spiritual barrier, but to fight spirit with steel is a futile endeavor. It repelled his sword like they were two opposing magnets. In desperation, he stabbed the blade forward, holding it against the barrier as steady as he could. Demonic Perry! His sword ignited with a burst of red spiritual energy, and sparks flew out all around him, singeing his clothes. Had his eyes still worked, the brightness may have blinded him. As he poured power through the blade, it pulled him forward. He had successfully shoved the tip of his sword through to the other side, only a few inches from a Vosslander's heart. Hold! Do not fear his blade! He'll fall before we do! Baylor felt the barrier touch his back. He was truly trapped now, moments away from being crushed under the pressure. Baylor would not relent in his assault, but it required all of him. He let down his demonic gaze, focusing all the power within him to break the barrier, but it would not budge. Blind and bound, Baylor prepared himself for the worst. The barrier disappeared. When he reactivated his gaze, all four Vosslanders collapsed on the ground, each one with an arrow stuck between a crease in their armor. Pole had only stood a few yards from him, 
laying in wait for a perfect ambush. But as he revealed himself for a decisive moment, a fifth Boslander appeared, stronger than the others. They had set a trap of their own. They barreled toward Paul with unmatched speed. By the time Paul could let loose another arrow, he would be no more than a head on the ground. Baylor felt an arrow fly down from up above. Had Paul actually prepared for this? Just like his fight with Baylor, one arrow had been left in the air to come to Paul's defense. But just like his bout with Baylor, this Vosslander had been prepared. The Vosslander twisted his body and slashed the arrow out of the sky with ease. Baylor's heart sank. He ran towards the boy, but knew he would arrive too late. Had he been followed? Had they witnessed his fight? Was he the reason the boy would die? As the Vosslander spun to fend off the quarrel, Paul stabbed another through the back of his head. The Vosslander dropped dead to the ground. Baylor stopped in his tracks, hardly believing what he just saw. You... you won? He looked over to Baylor without a worry in his blood-spattered eyes. I told you, I'm a fast learner. I won't fall for the same trick twice. Baylor felt like a fool, dumbstruck by Paul's tactical prowess. Paul looked back at his father's shack, now engulfed in flames. You'll need help to get to Walu. Baylor wished to reject his offer, but he could no longer look at Paul like a child. For now, he was just another warrior without a home.